It's a summer made for TV. Rockers, rescuers, psychics, and surfers. The small screen's got something for everyone. On the reality front, find out about Rockstar Season 2 and new shows including Treasure Hunters and America's Got Talent. On the drama side, favorites like The 4400, The Closer, and Rescue Me are back, along with new fare such as Psych and Saved. Plenty of action for kids, too, from a Danny Phantom reality special to new exciting The Backyardigans and Beyond the Break. It's a big, big summer on TV, and TV Guide's got the goods. Hello everybody, I'm John Fugelsang from the TV Guide channel's Water Cooler and I am here to help TV Guide Magazine present their big free summer preview DVD. This is TV Guide Magazine's picks of the hottest shows coming out all summer long. TV Guide Magazine is here to give you the inside scoop on a whole wave of brand new TV shows. We're going to break it all down for you through this special DVD. Now only TV Guide can bring you this look at exclusive clips and behind-the-scenes coverage of what to watch this summer. And when it comes to television, the editors at TV Guide magazine really know their stuff. But you already knew that, so grab a cool one and get comfy, because the summer TV watching season is about to heat up. From the search for a frontman for a brand new supergroup to an actual televised hunt for buried treasure, you can say reality TV is going to new depths to entertain. Here to wade through the offerings from the world of reality TV is TV Guide magazine writer Ali Gazin. Ali, it's great to have you here. Let's talk about rock stars. It's back again on CBS, but with a brand new band. What's different this time around? You know, last year they had In Excess, an already established band that was looking for a new lead singer. This year you've already established rockers like Motley Crue's Tommy Lee, Metallica's Jason Newsted, and Guns N' Roses' Gilby Clark. And they've are come together to form this new supergroup called Supernova, and they're looking for a lead singer. So instead of being an established band we already know, looking for a new singer, it's just constructed just for this episode, for exactly. this series. Exactly. They're trying to form this great new band. And of course, you've got these established rockers who everyone has grown up with and loves their music. So I think people will definitely be tuning in to see what they come up with this time. So Ali, for the record, you love Tommy Lee. Love him. Mm, I had no doubt. <laughs> now, there's not a lot of rock and roll shows on TV. Why is that? You, know, you have a lot of shows that are geared towards pop stars, and even CMT has a country music star search. And this show really fulfills that need for people who love rock music and, you know, love rock stars. I know there was a rumor for a while they were trying to make the show about Van Halen, but ultimately decided to pull a few rock legends together and make it a brand new band. Yeah, that was true. For a while there was a lot of names that were floating around there, and Van Halen was definitely one of them. But this is a new twist on the show that really worked last season. It's a cool way to bring something new to the table. Well, it's very exciting, and they certainly have some good personalities. So as you can imagine, wannabes of every ilk were lined up for a chance to audition for this show, from the very talented to the very opposite. We caught it all. Take a look. He's Motley Crue's bad boy drummer. He's bass player extraordinaire from Metallica. And he is a great guitarist for Guns N' Roses. Now, Gilby Clark, Jason Newstead, and Tommy Lee are joining forces to form a wild and crazy band called Supernova. I've known those guys for a while, but we've never done anything together, uh, you know, musically. So if you can just imagine what that's going to be like, it's going to be pretty unbelievable. You know, it's just so cool. It's like when uh, Supernova is when uh, stars collide and that, that effect is what a supernova is. And we got three stars right here, three big ones, and it's gonna be pretty incredible. More important, supernova's looking for a lead singer, and the entire nerve wracking process will unfold on season two of CBS's hit reality show, Rockstar. This is a continuation of last year's success. This series started off slow and grew really fast and big, and ended up, luckily, in the finale, even beating the finale of Big Brother. And so, yeah, we're going to continue on what we had from last year. Mark Burnett of Survivor and The Apprentice fame is back as executive producer. If you look at those three bands, Motley Crue, Metallica, and Guns N' Roses, 250 million albums sold between them. So it's a great launch pad for us. Former Red Hot Chili Pepper Dave Navarro returns as host. It is a tremendous opportunity, you know, to get national exposure on a television program like this. CBS, primetime, 
rock and roll on television. It's awesome. Needless to say, casting for this new supergroup turned into a global affair as rock star wannabes patiently lined up. We've been in line. How long have we been in line? Like two and a half hours? I was actually born here and I grew up pretty much in this line. CBS is searching the entire planet, like not just the, uh, you know, the states uh, this year. They're, they're searching the entire world. Um, and I think there's, by the time we're done with that, it'll be between 16 and 20,000 people that have gotten auditions. We're all gonna rock, <laughs> so, cause yeah. everybody here has heart, yeah. and we wanna give it to you! I'm your man, Drew Gash. Everybody wants the job, but for the 13-week series, the search will be narrowed to just 16 anxious contestants. I think I did pretty well, you know? I had some room for me at the beginning of it, and then at the end, a little a bit bigger than that, so I feel like I rocked it, you know? I think it went okay. A little nervous because there's a ton of people in there, but uh, you know, it was, it was all right. With an album and a tour in the works, what kind of bandmate are these rock veterans looking for? It's going to be someone who it, like someone who, who we probably have in our minds, doesn't exist. It's going to be someone special, someone that's just going to go up there and show us, you know, this is me, and we're going to go. That's exactly what we want. Yep. You know, we don't know. We can't. It, Guy, girl, it doesn't really matter. I don't want somebody that's standing necessarily in front of us or behind us. I yeah. want somebody that's standing next to us. Exactly. To stand up there in front of a loud band, you know, and kick yeah. ass, I mean, that's going to take a lot of guts, you know. As for the lucky winner, make no mistake, he or she will get a real rock and roll gig. We're going to find a new singer and just do something really cool. TV is going to be, you know, watch, you know, involved while we're doing it, but we're thinking about the band first. I think that this show can fall under the giant umbrella of reality TV in a way, but it also, it's way more serious than that. It's way more real than that, the real part of reality TV, because we have a tour, an album, and real lives that are affected in this band. Like, band does come first. So, there you go. People of Earth, imagine this scenario. Amazing Race meets National Treasure. On second thought, People of Earth, you don't have to imagine that. They've already begun shooting it. And it's a new NBC show called Treasure Hunters, where teams travel the globe in search of clues to a grand prize. So, Allie, it sounds cool, but how is this show going to work? When they get to these locations, they have to decipher codes, solve problems that will give them a clue that will ultimately lead them one step closer to finding this amazing treasure that they're all in search of. Now, who is this show going to appeal to? I think that people who love The Amazing Race will obviously love this, too. It's got that fast-paced, you know, racing for a prize element. But I also think that people who like history or like books like The Da Vinci Code will also really want to tune in. Uh, that's me, actually. I love history. But um, are teams going to be able to be eliminated from this show? Exactly. If you know if you're the last to arrive or the last to solve the clue, you're going to be out of the race, which obviously everyone wants to find the treasure. So what's going to happen in the end? Whatever team is left standing in the end will have the best shot of finding the treasure? No, the one team who puts together all the clues, they'll be able to find the treasure and win. Allie, do we have any idea what the treasure is? We have no idea. We'll just have to wait and see. So it could be a million dollars, it could be gold, it could be a bunch of Family Guy DVDs. Exactly. Okay. Well, with that, let's take a look now at Treasure Hunters. America has many treasures, some natural, some historic, but there's one buried treasure worth millions, locked in time, in a secret location, but if you're clever enough, the clues to find it are all around you. This is Treasure Hunters. Two sets of teams start their journey on opposite ends of the Earth. Neither group knows the other exists. Let's go, let's go, 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 go! Meet the geniuses. Between the three of us, we have nine majors and one master's. The grad students. Woo! Air Force. We're all kind of adrenaline junkies. XCIA and more. You guys, here! But this is more than a race. We go to Dover Castle, we gotta find out where it's at. It's a giant puzzle. It's just a dig, that's the clue. With pieces scattered all over the country and the world. You know, if hell ever froze over, it'd be in Alaska. That is the most physically challenging thing I've ever done. There it is, there it is. Each clue will lead them one step closer. Yeah! From the Arctic Circle to the South Seas. I say we're looking for a prism or a sphere. He saw something in here. To decode hidden messages. That's a D, not a U. 
Maybe something's backwards. In this adventure, brains are as valuable as brawn. We need a book on Morse code. Put that on. I'm thinking to myself, Keith is going to be the first person ever to drown in the ocean with a life vest on. They'll have to work together. Guys, the code is the order the presidents were in. 132616, and it opened. Because if they can't solve the mysteries... Take the presidential trail. Was there another trail that we didn't see? They could find themselves in the middle of nowhere. Francis! Where are you? And deception could be the only way out. We're in the wrong place. Where are we supposed to be? Hello? Huh? What's up, guys? You finding everything okay? No, we're at Mount Rushmore right now. What are you doing? Shit! I can't go on! 26. They'll use wits to crack the code. Run! I love being a treasure hunter! No! They'll use strength to find the treasure. Let's move! Help me look for a key. In television's smartest adventure. Treasure Hunters. Well, also over at NBC, America's sweetheart, American Idol's Simon Cowell, tries his hand at producing a variety show for the 21st century. The show is called America's Got Talent. And Ali, uh, it's fair to say this show has the feel of the old variety shows, very popular in the 60s and 70s. How is this show different from American Idol? This is sort of like the gong show, but without the gong. Anybody with any sort of talent can come out and try out. You've got singers, comedians, dancers, People with dancing dogs and a man who can put himself inside a bubble, all competing to be the next great Italian. Okay, will Simon weigh in on the acts? No, we don't think so. He's not going to be one of the judges this time out, but hopefully there'll be a snarky judge in his place. Okay, so you heard it here first. Simon Cowell will not be appearing on camera, but he will be insulting contestants off screen. So let's not keep viewers in suspense any longer. We went behind the scenes to see what Mr. Cowell's new show is all about. Take a look. Comedians, singers, and magicians. No, it's not the newest circus act. It's Simon Cowell's latest project, America's Got Talent. This will be, you know, arguably the biggest talent search, you know, you've ever, ever seen. So. It's an experiment, which could work or it could go horribly wrong. This competition is sure to be like no other. It's, it's literally open to anybody who believes, you know, he, she, they can be, you know, the most famous act in America. Uh, and we've ripped up the rule book. And within five minutes, I just saw an entire snapshot of, you know, kids who are singers, groups, 80-year-old singers, dog acts, ponies, pirates people who dance in balloons, I mean, just everything. Simon explains the show's premise. There's nine shows altogether, nine weeks. Uh, the first four shows are going to be the, the audition shows, which basically shows you everything. Any time during the audition, the judges can push a button, one X lights up, get three Xs, they all go ballistic, the act's over. It's a device I would love on American Idol. This show kind of gets me off the hook, because now, whatever you do, I can just say, enter America's Got Talent. Over 200 people will advance to the next round. Simon says expect the unexpected. It gets interesting on the middle stages of the show. We're going to have a big, big set at this stage. Everyone's going to be in the audition who's got through to the second stage, but you won't know whether you're going to be performing that night until your name is called. So you may get lucky, you may not. The point is, you won't have a, a proper rehearsal. you just got to be ready to perform if your name's called. Ten finalists will compete for the coveted title, a future spot, and some financial security. Where else? Sin City. They're going to walk away with something significant. We're going to write a check for $1 million, which is the highest amount I've ever given to anyone on any talent show I've ever done. Um, so you, you can say now, I'm looking for a million dollar talent. Of course, no talent show is a talent show without the judges. You know, we've tried to find people, A, with a sense of humor, which you're going to need on this show, and B, you've got to have experience with superstar acts. That's, that, to me, is essential. And we've been lucky that we've been approached by some big managers um, who've managed some of the biggest acts in the world. So they'll know what they're talking about. I would judge this show in a heartbeat. I'd love to be judging this. So does Simon really think that America's got talent? I love Americans. I like the sense of uh, optimism, enthusiasm, wackiness, and then beneath or between all of that somewhere is a diamond. And you just hope you're going to find that diamond. So you think you can dance?
No, I'm talking to you, Allie. Do you think you can dance? <laughs> I can dance. Can you dance? Uh, no, I'm a straight white guy. I'm not allowed. <laughs> but can you dance? That's what we'll find out when the second season of So You Think You Can Dance premieres on Fox. From the salsa to the jitterbug to hip hop, some hopefuls are strapping on their dance shoes for a chance of dancing immortality. Now, Allie, this show's a lot of fun. Is that what made the viewers want another season? Absolutely. Everyone, dancing is really the new craze. Everyone seems to love watching it. And here you had these really genuinely talented kids who are showing up and showing off their moves. And it was a lot of fun to watch. So what you're saying is, they can dance. They can. Of course, you're going to get your William Hung of the show, who is someone who thinks he can dance but really can't. But there are a ton of talented people out there, too. Okay, well, can these guys dance? You be the judge. There's only one way to find out. Here's a preview. Hello, and welcome to a brand new season of So You Think You Can Dance. The search is on for America's favorite dancer. Last year's finalists danced their way into the hearts and minds of America. Millions and millions of votes were cast, and in the end, Nick Lazzarini was the first ever winner of So You Think You Can Dance. Now, we're back. Bigger and better than ever. And once again, we're looking for America's favorite dancer. From b-boys to breakers. From ballerinas to ballroom dancers. Anyone can audition. And I mean anyone. We've traveled to New York. LA, Chicago, there you go. and Charleston looking for talent. And boy, did we find it. Girl, you're the. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Every single dancer wants one of these. It's an aeroplane ticket to the next stage of auditions in Vegas. <laughs> but it wasn't all good news. Oh. oh. <laughs> Who is that mother that, that British piece of shit? You are not going to reach that professional level the way you're going. It's hard to accept the cut. How many ways can I spell disaster? You could be the William Hung of So You Think You Can Die. <laughs> and it wasn't all good moves. <laughs> so who will win season two? That's up to you, America. <laughs> Well, that's about it for this special summer preview guide of all the new reality shows coming at you this summer. But don't forget, for a complete list of all the new shows out this season, you have to remember, TV Guide is your one-stop guide for all things television. In fact, it's the only magazine that matters. Special thanks to TV Guide magazine writer Ali Gazin. Thank you for having me. It's great having you. And I'm John Fugelsang. Hello again, and welcome to TV Guide Magazine's special preview of some of the new dramas premiering this summer. Now, some shows like The 4400, The Closer, and Rescue Me are returning favorites, while others, like Brotherhood and Saved, are brand new and premiering before the fall season even starts. It's very confusing. So, here to help us navigate the best of the new summer dramas is 
not this guy, but rather this guy, the senior critic of TV Guide magazine, Matt Rausch. Matt, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Let's start with one of the highest rated shows in cable right now, TNT's The Closer. Uh, of course, that's a great police drama starring Kira Sedgwick. What sets this show apart from all the other cop dramas we've seen, Matt? What makes The Closer special is that it's built around a woman. Kira Sedgwick comes in, she takes over a room full of men, they resent her, but then they come to respect her because she's the closer for a reason. When she gets in the interrogation room with a suspect, she closes every case. She's really great at what she does, but personally she's kind of a mess, so she's a fun character to watch as well. But her hair always looks good, and that's what's important. <laughs> now, this was kind of the surprise hit of last summer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. TNT had not done dramas for a number of years, so this kind of came out of nowhere. But it also ties into this trend of hot crime dramas. CSI's in repeats for the summer, so people, they gravitated to the closer, and they liked what they saw. Well, okay, I'm convinced. I'll watch. Let's take a look right now at TNT's The Closer, starring Kira Sedgwick. You could have told me about it in person, in advance. What? Yeah, I can't talk about this now. Because... Yeah, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but we just lost a 15-year veteran in a shootout, and that's actually more important than you are at the moment. Leahy, is it true your people were circulating 100 flyers of some guy who was not connected to the crime? I got 98 of them back. And where's Detective Martin's partner? Detective Xavier is waiting in Commander Taylor's office with the murder book and the informant packet. All right, so unless you'd like to start collecting your pension tomorrow, Central had better back off and allow Priority Homicide to do its job. You're dismissed, sir. Oh. Uh, Captain, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm afraid that we're really going to need all these flyers, because otherwise we can have That's it all. That's good enough for me. 98% is fine. Go on, Captain. You understand that this is not a picture of the informant that Detective Morton was working with, and as long as... I don't want to talk about this anymore. You left the police officer lying next to the man who shot him, and that is never done. The reason I left Detective Martin lying there is the police officers are trained to fire in bursts. And Martin only put one shot into Barack, one. And the bodies were lined close together, too close. And what was Martin doing there in the first place? Now, he and Detective Xavier were working with an undercover informant, and I need to question him. You can't release the informant's name to law enforcement. Well, how am I supposed to talk to him, Will? What if he's not just, just waiting by the phone? Why is it that you can never do your job without constantly complaining about everything? The informant was guaranteed anonymity. You can release his name to one other member of your squad, and that's it. Now, I have upheld your authority with the entire department looking on. But when a police officer is killed, we expect closure quickly and completely. Is that clear? Yes, it is. Your attitude, however, is a complete mystery. Well, who's not a mystery to film and TV viewers is the show's star, Ms. Kira Sedgwick, who's been acting since she was 16 years old. Matt, how key is the casting of Kira Sedgwick to this show's big success? Well, she got a Golden Globe nomination, so it's essential. The closer without Kira Sedgwick is like 24 without Kiefer Sutherland. Mm, well, she's a great actress, so I saw her on Broadway with Helen Hunt in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, and she brought the house down, stole she's, the whole show. She's great. Well, let's hear from Kira right now and her thoughts behind her character's growing popularity with viewers. The Closer on TNT is one of the hottest new crime dramas on TV. Detective Brenda Johnson, played by Kira Sedgwick, is a Southern belle with a tough attitude and an eccentric personality. As hard as a secret is to uncover, it's even harder to keep. She's a, a complicated creature and um, very much uh, herself. I think that she um, never not quite know what's going to come out of her mouth. The CIA-trained former Atlanta PD detective comes to Los Angeles to run the LAPD's Priority Homicide Division, a special unit that specializes in delicate, high-profile murder cases. As an excellent interrogator, Johnson has a talent for getting the truth out of her suspects, making her the ultimate closer. Her biggest problem is not the criminals she deals with, but being accepted as a leader in the male-dominated police force. You're into this. What's so important about I don't report to you, Captain, so your question is irrelevant. Excuse okay. everybody, just calm down. The conflict comes within the LAPD, different factions of the LAPD, and her particular group, so that there'll always be something for 
for Brenda to bump up against because what fun would it be otherwise? Two-time Golden Globe nominee Kira Sedgwick has made the switch from film to TV and is enjoying her role as Brenda Johnson. You know, I wasn't looking to do anything like this, um, but I, I just love the character so much. I thought she was so, so multifaceted and so fascinating. And I felt like um, I could enjoy playing her for a long time. Sedgwick may love playing one of the most dynamic women on TV, but isn't much like her. Well, she's a lot smarter than I am, um, for sure. Um, I'd say I'm more emotionally intelligent, but she's definitely more uh, book smart and detail oriented. Roughly 7 million people watched its premiere, making it Basic Cable's most watched scripted series telecast ever. Women love the show, women relate to Brenda, women see themselves in her. The comments that I get from the guys are, she's so great, she's so feisty, and she's so, um, it's like you can't help but love her even though she's, she's a pain in the butt. And I, I love that about her, that she can be, that she can appeal to, to both. You know, they may dislike me because I'm new. Yeah. Because Captain Taylor doesn't want me here. Relax well because, once I get to work and they see me in action, they'll have a whole list of other reasons to hate my guts. The Closer, season two, begins June 12th. That's a Monday. Monday's at 9 on TNT. Now, another returning favorite this summer is the 4400. It's back on USA for a third season. And Matt, I bet all the sci-fi junkies are a little bit excited that this show is finally coming back. That's right. I mean, this is sort of like an X-Files kind of a show. Very lot of mythology in this, a lot of complicated backstories and intrigue. 4400 is about people who are vanished. They just disappeared all of a sudden over 50 or 60 years. Some have been gone for 50 years, some have been gone for five years. They all show up at once back on Earth, and it turns out they came back from the future. But what they're doing and what their special gifts mean, there's so many mysteries about the 4400. That's what keeps people watching. Okay, so where do we leave off on the show, and then what's coming up this new season? One of the cool things about the cliffhanger from last summer is that a baby that was born to two of the 4400, all of a sudden she's grown up into like a teenager or something. She grew up overnight, so we don't know what that's all about, but we're about to find out. All right, Matt, sounds good. Let's take a look right now at a clip from the 4400. The world has changed. Everything is different now. The Promycin Inhibitor Program was an international effort. Its goal was to prevent the coming of a world dominated by a tiny fraction of the population. In short, we were doing everything we could to prevent the 4400 from developing extra human capabilities. We believed that without the Inhibitor Program, these abilities would show up in virtually every single one of the 4400. I don't think I need to explain to this committee why that would be something less than the best case scenario. Overnight, normal human beings like you and I and all the institutions we've come to rely on would be obsolete. The program wasn't perfect. People got sick, some died. That was not our intent. But now, it's gone. And the future that we were trying to prevent is here, and we are not ready. I believe it comes down to a question of power. Who is going to hold it? Us or them? Because believe me, it's going to come down to us against them. Sean, you're not making any sense. Just tell me what's wrong with Isabel. I told you, I can't explain. Is she sick? Is she hurt? Let's see for yourself. Dad. Who the hell is this? Where's Isabel? I am your daughter. I'm Isabel. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get it. It's not a joke. Something happened. I, I changed. I don't know how. She just walked in here. She knew my name. She seems to know about you and Lily. Stop. I don't know what game you're playing here, and I don't care. Richard, Richard. The door's open, come in. What? What is it? Oh, you're naked. 
I'm more comfortable this way. I haven't really gotten used to them. Clothes. I have a bathrobe. Could you put it on, please? This better? Almost. Never met anybody that read the encyclopedia from cover to cover before. Oh, I'm not finished. I just delivered those to you yesterday. Okay, you're a fast reader. That's really cool. Um, listen, they're looking for you down in the labs. You're like an hour late. Have they sent you to get me? Aren't you in charge? Oh, yeah, more or less. You know, I go where I'm needed. They were scared of me, weren't they? Pretty much. That's all right. I think even my parents are frightened of me. I don't think your mom and dad are scared of you. I think they're just confused. You know? I don't blame them. It's mostly how I feel, too. I don't understand what happened to me. I don't understand what happened to my mother. And I'm trying to read and learn things, but I still feel lost. See, now you sound like a real 4400. But I'm not a 4400. Not like my mother and father. Or you. Okay, also back for a third season, but this time on FX is the gritty drama Rescue Me. Dennis Leary created the show, and he plays firefighter Tommy Gavin. Going into its third season, FX's firefighter drama Rescue Me is preparing to tackle more than just fires. Co-creator and star Dennis Leary gives us the scoop. There's a real shocker that uh, occurs at the end of the first episode this year. Basically, this season is about uh, his family falling uh, apart um, permanently. In a near-perfect mix of drama and comedy, the show will continue its raw look at firefighting in New York City after 9-11. How about a cookie with my cousin's face on it, huh? Last report they had on him the morning 9-11, he was stuck in this tower right here, right in the middle, huh? How about that? Of course, comedy is Leary's first love, and he won't let us forget it. Want to get a dime, Mr. Fireman? Yep, uh, eventually, uh, but not today. My mom's gonna kill us. Hey, guys, I'm gonna need a pound of butter and a whipsaw, all right? Leary's Tommy Gavin has lost friends, family, and some hope, but not his faith or passion. Let's light that car on fire and put it out. That would kill a couple hours. His leadership may be questionable, but never question. Hey, Tom! Tom, can you hear me? See if I got a man down, I need some help up here. Rounding out the beefy cast are Stephen Pasquale, Michael Lombardi, and Daniel Sunyata who have spent two years proving their dedication to the job and each other. The camaraderie between the guys and the brotherhood that the guys have, and it's sort of like that fraternal relationship. I think it's interesting to see, you know, how it plays out, whether they're, uh, you know, busting balls or they, at the end of the day, they all love one another and they're there to protect one another. And this season, another tender side may emerge with the help of guest stars Susan Sarandon and Marissa Tomei. So it's, and I think that gives us a count of three um, Oscar winners. Tender or not, adding some Oscar winners to this cast can only make things hotter. Now, Matt, this show has a huge following. Where did we leave off last season? Things were not looking good for Tommy Gavin. He had just gotten his family back together again, and then his young son is killed in a hit-and-run accident. It was just an absolute tragedy. It's pulled him down, and it's broken the family back apart. How he rescues his life, is that's what we're going to have to be watching in the second season. You sound like a real fan of this. It's a great show. The FX dramas are so edgy, and they really take you into places almost no other show goes to. They're dark, and they're adult, and they are fascinating. So then, what's going to be happening this coming season on Rescue Me? A very cool casting coup. They have Susan Sarandon coming on board for several episodes. If she can do for the firehouse what she did back in Bull Durham days, it's going to be a hot summer at Rescue Me. All right, you heard from Dennis, you heard from Matt. Now let's get to a preview of the new season of Rescue Me. Check this out. 
Yo, who's getting us? I thought it was loose. Yeah, it turned the time for him to disappear. I'm tapped, guys. I got it, boys. Good man. Yeah, there is plenty of talent here tonight, boys. You can't yeah. make it here. You can't make it anywhere. There's a dame that's been checking us out all night. Oh, yeah? Where? At the end of the bar. Sexy. Very sexy. Ah, sure of herself. Independent. Yep. What a great rack. I'm going over. <sighs> you know, <clears throat> she looks like my mom. What did you say? That lady, she, she reminds me of my mom. Shit. Your mom is that hot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, hotter, really. Your mom has that kind of face? Those lips? That kind of uh, rack? Yeah, well, my mom's rack is a little bigger, actually. Okay, you know what? Where do you get off mentioning your mom and the word rack in the same set? I'm just saying, my mom, she's, she's got, like, a large set of, you know, she's really, in terms of, like, Enough. the top. Jesus Christ. What? I was, I was gonna go over and talk to that chick. I mean, let me qualify that, because she's not a chick. In a room full of self-involved, young, titless little chicks. She's a woman, okay? A real woman. Probably a very, very witty and wonderful woman. What a great rack. The rack was secondary, okay? It doesn't matter now, but the point being, I can't go over and talk to her now. Well, why? Uh, why not? Because even if I went over and talked to her and got her to go home with me somehow and got her to reveal the aforementioned great rack, all I'd be thinking about is your mom's rack and how great your mom's rack is. Not that I've ever thought of your mom's rack before, but that's all I can think of now. Hey. Your mom's rack! Whoa, hey, you know what? My mom's married, pal, okay? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what? Forbidden fruit, ball face. I mean, like melons? Jesus Christ, would somebody please make a move? I'm just watching. Yeah, Chief, that's the problem. We're all just watching, okay? What the hell's a Proby doing? 900 pounds of fresh ass in here. He's over there talking to some dude. It's his friend Hank. He went to Proby school with him. Yeah, well, that's real sweet. Excuse me, guys. Do I know you? Because I'm sitting over there with my friend Gail. That's her over there. Hi, Gail. Anyway, I'm sitting over there, and I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking, I know this guy. I know I know him. How do I know you? Uh, maybe she's seen you on the news, Tom. Mm, you're a reporter. No, no, I know I'm a, I'm a firefighter. <gasps> like a real New York City firefighter? That's amazing. The job that you do? Yes, uh, Tommy Gavin. Nice to meet you. How are you? Can I buy you a drink, Tommy Gavin firefighter, sir? Um, no, but I'll do you one better. I'll buy you a drink. Okay. <laughs> All right, after you. All right, if I'm not back in an hour, forget about me. See, Chief, now that's how it's done. Huh? Hey, where the hell did you take off to? Oh, Paris. Best place to take a piss this time of night. <laughs> Tommy found something? No, something found him. And it looks like you have a secret admirer. You ever see Garrity's mom? Nope. Well, good luck and Godspeed. Wow. Thank God I took the time to pound on my balls before I left the house. Mm. How'd I look? Pretty drunk. A little more might help. I'm good. Hi there. I just um, thought I'd uh, come over and introduce myself, you know, let you know that it's okay. Kind of get checked out by women all the time, because as you may know or you know may suspect, I'm uh, with the FDNY, you know, America's Heroes. Blah 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 blah. blah. I'm um, I'm Lieutenant Ken Che, at your service. Anyone? She wants you. Me? <laughs> well, I'm young enough to be it. Oh, hell, there's nothing else going on. Garrity, this doesn't work out. Your mother's tits are on deck. That's not funny. Oh, it's funny. Uh, no, it's not. Now, new to TNT this summer is Saved, a dark, edgy drama that premieres June 12th and airs Mondays at 10. So, Matt, I've heard it's dark. 
Just how dark is this show? Well, it's as dark as any paramedic adventure would be. This is a story about a self-destructive paramedic. He lives on the edge. He's a gambler. He's all about risk. And the paramedic's job is basically to get to the people before they even get to the ER. So it's not going to be pretty. It's a pretty raw look at this person's life. Well, that's great. I want to see a show that makes me scared to call 911. Thank you, Matt. Uh, how is Tom Everett Scott in the show? Well, Tom Everett Scott, he's perfect for this role because he's both charming and he also has sort of a little bit of a dark side, but his natural charm brings you into the character. Now, we know Tom Everett Scott from where? The Tom Hanks movie, That Thing You Do, right? That Thing You Do, and he was also on ER for a while playing Abby's troubled brother. Well, he's troubled again, but he's all on his own this time. Okay, thanks, Matt. As you heard, Saved stars Tom Everett Scott as a paramedic. So here are Tom's thoughts on his character and a quick look at the premiere episode. I think the character of Wyatt is a very complex uh, guy. And that's why I was really attracted to the part. Because here's this guy who um, has these terrible relationships with the people in his life, like his, his family and his, um, his girlfriend, the love of, former love of his life. And he just can't have a, a, a real relationship with them. He can't handle dealing with them, but with these strangers, he's an ambulance, you know, he's a, he's a paramedic, uh, with these strangers who need him, you know, that he, he has this intimate connection with them, um, he's fine, he's comfortable, he's more comfortable with these strangers than he is with, you know, than with the people in his life. Hi, mom and your daddy home? I'll have a mom and your daddy. Is that the ambulance? Cute, let him in. He, he passed out. I don't know what happened. I've been trying to wake him. He dead? They're trying to save him. What's your name, little man? Clinton. We call him Q. Okay, Q. Why don't you take your, uh... She's my aunt. Okay, why don't you take your aunt and take her in the next room? All right. He's not breathing much on his own. You want to tube him? <laughs> now, let me hit him with the Narcan first. Window. I ain't going nowhere with you. Did I tell you to call 911? You were out. I thought you were dying. No, I look like I'm dying. Hey, sir, why don't you let us take you into observation? I told you. If I want to ride, I will call a cab. Sir, can you at least sign the paper saying you refuse treatment? I ain't going anywhere with you. Can I go with you? Hey, why aren't you in school, Quentin? Are you sick? You a doctor? Do you like doctors? No. Good. Neither do we. Now imagine, if you will, this scenario. One brother is a politician. The other is a criminal. No, I'm not talking about George and Neil. And no, I'm not talking about Bill and Roger. I'm talking about the scenario behind Showtime's Brotherhood. Now, Matt, this show is somewhat similar to The Sopranos, but with kind of a twist, right? Well, the twist is it's not just the criminal life. It's also this politician who's trying to go right, but there's gray areas in both of their lives. And it's set in Providence, Rhode Island, so it's trying to do for Providence, Rhode Island what the Sopranos did for Jersey. And it's very gritty and very realistic simming, and it should appeal to the same kind of audience. Now, we've seen the thin line between crime and politics before on shows like Deadwood and The Sopranos. What's the appeal of a mob-slash-political show like this? Well, if you do it right, shows like this are very smart and gripping, and it's all about character. And here it's all about family. And so much like The Sopranos, you're going to get the intrigue that happens in a political life or in a criminal life, but it's also tied into family bonds because these guys are brothers. So that makes it even more appealing. Imagine if Tony Soprano had a brother that really mattered. Well, I'm psyched to see this show. It sounds like a very complex Irish-American family coming up on Showtime. And the show's stars recently sat down with TV Guide magazine to give us their take on brotherhood. Here's what they had to say. Welcome home to Providence, Rhode Island, where you're part of a family and you're living the American dream or nightmare. 
He's a gangster. Showtime's new hour-long drama, Brotherhood, follows the lives of two brothers on opposite sides of the law, but with a common goal. Come on, Tommy. Everything's gonna be okay. I just wanna know what your plans are. Like, uh, chicken in every pot. Justice for the working man, same as you. Well, if that's the case, why don't we just team up and take over the world? There you go. Jason Clark is State Senator Tommy Caffey, with a wife, family, and a position in the community. Tommy's a politician, you know, brought up in a basically a fatherless house with a very strong mother. Married his childhood sweetheart, becomes a politician, you know, loves, loves what he does and loves the people around him and will do anything to protect them. Jason Isaacs is Michael Caffey, Tommy's older brother, provider, father figure, and he's on the run from the FBI. I think Michael's biggest virtue is that he's, uh, he's loyal to a fault and, uh, and because he's been out in the world, he's traveled in the world, and he's been to some pretty uh, difficult places. Annabeth Gish stars as Eileen Caffey, living the lie of the happy politician's wife. I play a woman, I'm, I'm married to the state senator, Tommy Caffey. We have a great life in that we're, you know, we're married and have three daughters, but I have some, um, shall we say, darkness of my own. Since when has Michael bent to pressure from anyone? You think he even cares what happens to Tommy? In this small town, the old ways of street justice and loyalty threaten to break bonds. The Caffey brothers fight back with bonds of their own. Okay, again, Brotherhood is new on Showtime this summer. Here's a small taste of what to expect from this first season. I know why I known they were upset. They were terrified. Just tell them everything's gonna be okay. Tell them it was a mistake. Tell them Uncle Mike gives his word. It'll never happen again. I don't lie to my kids. Hey, why should I let you? Sorry, your search came up dry, but nobody asked you to charge in there like a fat lady at the buffet. You compromised our security when you injected yourself into our operation. Now, you're just looking to pass the buck because you blew the house on a grade one house clown like Mo Riley. Mr. Riley came to us voluntarily, something he obviously wasn't comfortable doing with you. Excuse me? No, he came to you because he knew he could get you to pay for the plastic surgery on his ear. We merely arranged for the surgeon. Who paid for the hospital? It was a federal VA. You blow in here, demand access to our files with no reciprocity, and then you insinuate that we're a bunch of corrupt blabbermouths? You. Do you or do you not have a personal relationship with Michael Caffey? Mm -hmm. We both grew up on the hill. It's not like I'm sucking his... We're in full control from here on in. Your men will answer to us on a strictly need-to-know basis. Also coming up on Showtime this summer is the dramedy Weeds. And as the name implies, this show involves uh, pot. Lots and lots of pot all being sold by one really sweet suburban housewife. And things went so well last season, the show is back for more. It turns out millions of people watched it once and got hooked on it. So, Matt, there aren't a lot of great suburban stoner comedy dramas on TV these days. What makes Weed so popular? Well, Weeds is a suburban satire, so it's about the things that are under the surface of this bedroom community, and it focuses on this one character who is in such desperate straits. She was widowed in the first season. The only way to keep her family afloat was to basically deal. And so this isn't deal or no deal. This is Weeds, and she is really living basically a secret life, and Mary Louise Parker does a great job of conveying the panic behind this woman's illegal existence. Well, now, Mary Louise Parker won a Golden Globe for her role on the show and beat out all four actresses from Desperate Housewives earlier this year. Do you think this is the season for her and this show to really break out? Well, I would hope so. I, it's a very appealing concept, and it takes you in a place where they wouldn't even dare to go on Wisteria Lane. So for those who are looking for their suburban satire to have a real bite to it, uh, Weeds is smoking. Just who are all the players on this Showtime original drama comedy? Well, here's a little taste to see if you like it. There are no secrets in this town. Mm. Maybe a few. No. None. You're having money problems. Our children had sex. Judy Gordon orders Oxycontin over the internet, but you didn't hear that from me. I don't like gossip. 
Weeds is Showtime's newest hit. This provocative series stars Mary Louise Parker, Elizabeth Perkins, and Kevin Nealon as neighbors in a Just Add Water community. Agrestic is a community outside of Los Angeles, and it is the epitome of normal. Where every house looks exactly the same, and everybody drives the exact same SUV. It's sort of like the old Hanna-Barber cartoons, where the, the person's running in their house, and even though they keep running for like a mile, it's the same background. You know, it's like face doorway. Malls and homes and malls and homes. Face. Doorway. And a school and a park and malls and homes. But Agrestic is anything but majestic. For the characters living in this manicured world, it's the strangest thing. Keeping up with the Joneses comes at a very high price. She's got the big bag. Guess you left her pretty well fixed, huh? I heard there was nothing. Nancy Botwin, uh, the character I play, has lost her husband recently, and she's fairly damaged, but not really dealing with it at all. She's a widow um, with basically no skill set. She is trying to get by by dealing marijuana. If this doesn't work out, I could end up being the oldest Gap employee in Southern California, but... You a hustler. You're going to do just fine. She's really struggling to maintain the lifestyle she and her husband established for her children. From all the books I have read, you should really be encouraging Shane and Silas to talk about Judah's death. Celia, I had no idea you read books. Celia Hodes is very concerned with appearances. She's very concerned with what people think of her, what people think of her daughter and her clothes and her car and her house. I know that you think she's beautiful, Dean, but this is America. It is cold and cruel out there for fat girls. How's it going? I play Doug Wilson. I'm on the city council, and I'm also Nancy's accountant. And I help her launder her money. Did my cover business eventually become my real business? Don't worry about it. Just pick something uh, with low inventory. I am so screwed. Nancy's first lessons in supply and demand teach her that the grass is greener across the tracks. Tilia is a weed supplier. I'll, I'll just make it simple that way. Hey, that looks a little small. Bitch, I can eyeball an ounce from out of space with my glasses. Great. Give me. Conrad lives with his aunt, Helia. In fact, Conrad's kind of the man around the weed house. Nancy's got to teeter-totter back and forth between both worlds in order to conduct business. What she finds on our side of the tracks is this comforting, genuine relationship. I mean, my aunt's constantly calling on white bitch, dingy broad, but at the same time, the heart and the sincerity, she can feel it. Hey, you need to recognize. All right, all right, fine. I'm a bitch ass bitch. <laughs> Weeds takes a blunt. Can we have sex in your house? Unforgettable. I know you got troubles, but like my mama always said, tough shit. An often funny look. Ow! At a sprawling America. Take that crap off my money. You not giving me a present. Excuse me for trying to bring a little beauty into an ugly world. Some people will be upset, and some people will be really glad to see us. Now, something else we're all glad to see the return of is Entourage. For two seasons now, we've followed the antics of film star Vince Chase and his posse as they travel the Hollywood circuit. Now, they're back for more. Now, Matt, i got to be honest, uh, I live in L.A. part of the time, and so when I go home, I watch TV to get away from guys like this. Uh, what's the appeal of Entourage to people? Well, because most people don't live in L.A., there's something very glamorous about being a fly on the wall around somebody who's truly famous or just being around somebody who's famous. That's what I think is what really gets people watching Entourage. These guys are living the high life, and Vince is right on the edge of stardom, so there's something really interesting about where he is in his life right now, and it's a life that we kind of all dream that we could possibly have. This show left us with lots of cliffhangers last season, didn't it? Yes, it did. He was just beginning to get his big break. He was going to make Aquaman for James Cameron. He was going to star opposite his ex-girlfriend, Mandy Moore. And his agent, Ari Gold, had just been fired in a scenario right out of Jerry Maguire. So there's so many stories to tell in the new season. Very anxious to see it. Well, thanks, Matt. Now, we caught up with the Entourage guys, busy filming this new third season right here in L.A. Take a look. Hey. Vince better not be in that car. Entourage fans, you're in luck. HBO's hugely popular show about the snake pit we call Hollywood is back this summer for a third season. Well, I'm, I'm having a great time. I, I do. I love my job. Jeremy Piven plays super aggressive two-faced agent Ari Gold, whose most important client is hot new actor Vincent Chase, played by Adrian Grenier. 
Vince's loyal entourage includes three close pals. Manager Eric Murphy, played by Kevin Connolly. Half-brother and struggling actor Johnny Drama, played by Kevin Dillon. And music manager Turtle, played by actor Jerry Ferrara. Season two of the show ended in a cliffhanger, with Agent Ari in big trouble. As you know, Ari kind of tried to stage a coup in the second season, and uh, his plans were... Uh, were uh, frappéed by his boss, so it kind of blew up in his face. Expect plenty of backbiting and intrigue in season three as well. Ari has to rise like a phoenix, and, and he'll definitely do it. I can't tell you too much, and I really wish that I could. He starts this new office, and um, he's got a small team, and everything's growing. The stakes are really high. This season we're dealing with uh, the release of Vince's movie, Aquaman. Whether that takes him to the next level or not, and how it affects every uh, everybody around him when you become a bigger star. Well, Johnny's got some uh, good things happening this year. He gets a little job, which is a pretty good job, and his career might be on the way up again. I don't know how long it's going to last. We haven't gotten too many scripts, but I think they, they enjoy watching Johnny struggle as well too. So. Somehow, Johnny always seems to screw everything up, so we'll see what happens. This season, Turtle is going to continue in the, the rat management game, and uh, let's just say he's going to come as close as someone can get to actually becoming a, a mogul. He has one client, and uh, the client explodes at some point. Then a choice has to happen where is he going to continue with this, or is he going to stay with Vince's guy? Eric, he's obviously dealing with all of the, the you know, stuff that comes along with getting bigger and getting to the next level and how he handles that. Celebrity guests will add to the show's star power. We got James Cameron's back from last year, Jimmy Woods, um, Martin Landau's coming on the show. As for why the show is such a critical and commercial success, the cast has a simple explanation. I think it really captures Hollywood in a, in a way that a lot of people haven't seen. And I think what really makes it work is the, the friendship thing. There's, there's four guys who just really love each other and take care of each other. We now turn our attention to Deadwood, which returns for a third season on June 11th. Just what can we expect? Here's a preview. What we see in Deadwood the first couple of seasons is order without law over the course of the third season. Just how soaked in blood the pure process of capitalism can be is made pretty clear. Well, the, the season this year starts literally where last season went off. The introduction of Hearst. As the season progresses this year, it's why is Hearst still here? I mean, it was welcomed at first. And then it becomes more complicated. Real clear lines are going to be drawn between the people in the camp and, and Hearst. There's more money, more wealth. The mines will get deeper, so that'll bring in richer people. Much more powerful forces than what we have here. George Hearst is representative of them. He seems to want to take over the town, which naturally irks Swearingen. Did he come to you by a different path, Mr. Hearst? Did he somehow circumnavigate? The outside forces coming in to Deadwood are causing the, the, the forces that exist within Deadwood to come together. Bullock's trying to keep things in check, you know? Bullock's trying very hard to not let his, his temper get the best of him. Instincts are to, you know, get this guy out of town. I just want to go kill Hurst. I want to go kill him, and that's what I would do unless he stop me. You can't just kill us. You can't do that, so they have to find another way of dealing with it. We may do away with them, but the ones that are coming behind them it will immediately wipe us all out. So Hearst comes in here and he's strong-arming people. We're trying to actually kind of have real law against people like him. He has turned into be what he was in life, and that's a force to be reckoned with. I'd not have you step one more foot forward, Ellsworth. Also, the other stuff that comes along is the relationships. When last you saw Alma and Ellsworth, they were riding off to their lovely honeymoon, and everything looked hunky-dory. Not every marriage stays that way. I'll just say that there are ripples in the brook. Um, some of them are pretty intense ripples. You know, Trixie's now involved with Solstar. And Swearingen likes that. He loves Trixie. When Trixie feels any kind of warmth or connection or goodness, her natural, at this stage in her life, reaction is to scream and kick and, and hit things. It's like those kind of feelings she doesn't maybe feel she deserves, I'm not sure. Swearingen has. Who was I just talking 
to? I don't know. You said you'd just gone to piss. How does law form out of social chaos? And this was a petri dish of absolute chaos because those are the type of folks that it attracted. And uh, and that's the truth of it. It's a, a place where there's no law, no jurisdiction, no judges, no I mean, no nothing. Anyone who comes into a situation who has an awful lot of power can take full advantage of what is a chaotic situation. And so it's anarchy. And I think a, a great part of the series is people figuring out how to form community and government and culture. Anyone who brings any sort of order, even maybe bad order, to a place like that, it's better than no order at all. Just another 12 days in Deadwood. That's good, good. Okay, now it's time for something new. This is called Psych, and it's about to debut on the USA Network, and I guess it can best be described as a crime drama comedy. I have no idea what that means, but I'm sure Mr. Matt Rausch does. Matt, what is this show about? Well, it, it's in the same vein as Monk, which is also a crime drama and a comedy series. Psych is about a young guy who has uncanny powers of observation. He was taught by his dad, who's a cop, to notice everything. And so he noticed everything if he sees it on television. He can phone in crime tips, but the police don't understand why he knows everything. They begin to think he's a criminal. Instead, he says, no, I'm a psychic. So he's pretending to be a psychic, and he becomes a police consultant, but it puts him in all kinds of weird situations. Him and his sidekick, played by West Wing's Dooley Hill, are, have great chemistry together, and it's basically a pretty funny show about a guy who is probably the best detective in the room, but can't admit it. It sounds like you like it. Do you think this show has a good chance of breaking out this year? I think it does, because Monk, again, it came out of nowhere a number of years ago, and again, it premiered in the summer, too, so Psych is the kind of show that the USA Network viewer likes to see. Okay, trust this guy, folks. Here's your first look at the brand new show, Psych. <laughs> I have a job for you. I already have a job. They're paying you to play video games? How do you do that? Come on. Left hand's baseball, right hand arrow keys? Cuss. You should ask me a challenging question every once in a while just for kicks. Awesome! You named your fake detective agency Psych? Why don't you just call it, hey, we're fooling you and the police department. Hope we don't make a mistake and someone dies because of it. First of all, Gus, that name is entirely too long. It would never fit on the window. So I'm supposed to quit my job, skip over, and do this for no guaranteed money. No guaranteed money, but all guaranteed fun! At headquarters, I suddenly and miraculously have a vision. Oh, I'm seeing, what am I seeing? 831. On Highway 138. Exactly, in the spirit world, things get jumbled and out of sequence. Show on, please. We both put on our surprise faces. This is mine. No! Oh. What do you got? Gus, that's horrible. It doesn't convey surprise at all. You've got a source somewhere, and I'm gonna find it. I'm not gonna let you just waltz around here like some kid in a candy store. Let me be honest with you, detective. I used to work in a candy store, and it's nothing like this. You solved one mystery, and now you're rented office space? Gus, I've solved a bunch of mysteries. For instance, the mystery of who kept stealing your newspaper. Answer, me. The mystery of what we're doing this weekend. Hint, it involves dragsters. And finally, the mystery that is the case the chief just brought me in on. You got another case already? Put some clothes on. This is going to be fun. Let's go. I'm driving. Where are your keys? Never mind. I got them. Ooh. Should I slice this up for the road? Psych. Premieres Friday, July 7th at 10 on USA. Characters welcome. Okay, that's it for this special summer preview guide of all the new dramas. For a complete list of all the new shows out this season, come on, you can't forget. TV Guide Magazine is your one-stop guide for all things television. So, my thanks to TV Guide Magazine's heroic senior critic, Mr. Matt Rausch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. And I'm John Fugelsang. Hello again. So, you want to know what's new in the world of family TV this summer? Well, plenty, it turns out. 
Not surprisingly, the good folks from the Nickelodeon family of networks are leading the way. Now, TV Guide Magazine's West Coast Bureau Chief, Craig Tomashoff, joins us now to talk about those shows that appeal to the whole family. First off the bat, Craig, uh, you guys have a show now called The Backyardigans. Um, I'm a little bit past this demographic, but you've got kids. Help me out here. What's this show all about? Well, it's actually, I quizzed my uh, four-year-old daughter this morning to, because you don't really meet a middle-aged man talking about the backyard again. So this comes directly from her. Uh, you've got five friends who, strangely, live in a backyard. I can name them all. If you quiz me, I can actually remember each and every one of the backyard again because um, I study. Uh, and uh, they go off on a different adventure every week, and, uh, and kids, there's a lot of music. Actually, I think the most enjoyable thing about it is uh, there's a lot of music, and it's computer-generated, uh, the animation. And there's a lot of choreography, actually. It's, uh, the choreographer used to actually work for the Alvin Ailey Dance Company, so the dances actually are pretty legit. Well, here's my question for you, Craig. It sounds pretty fun, but is this the sort of thing that grown-ups can watch along with the kids without going crazy? Actually, you know, it, it's the kind of thing, that, there's two things that are good for grown-ups. One, you don't watch it so much as you watch your kid watching it, and it actually is, I have to say, kind of cute watching your kid watch this show because they get up and they dance. Uh, but the music, surprisingly, is, is actually pretty sophisticated. In the, the special called High Tea that they're going to have uh, um, coming a little later this summer, uh, there's actually like really nice Irish folk music in it. Um, and you know, they've, they've had uh, you know, reggae music, they've had just about every kind of music you can, and, and grown-ups will appreciate that. Oh, right on. Well, it's always good to see a kid's show that grown-ups can enjoy at the same time. And the good folks over at Nick Jr. sent us a clip of the Backyardigan special, High Tea, premiering Monday, June 19th. Check this out. Join the Backyardigans for the perfect cup of tea. Come to the Backyardigans Tea Party, premiering June 19th, only on Nick Jr. Now, imagine if you were half human, half ghost. Oh, the interesting scenarios that conjures up. I'm not half ghost, I'm just very pale. But for Danny Phantom, half human, half ghost is his DNA makeup. The boy wonder is the star of the Nickelodeon animated series. And when you're half ghost, you can bet you've got some pretty cool paranormal powers to go with it. Am I right, Craig? Oh, don't you know it. You know, when you're a high school kid, what you really want is to have the paranormal powers. It's, uh, you know, it can come in handy in very many ways. Craig, who exactly is Danny Phantom? Well, again, I've had to consult the experts, so I asked my eight-year-old son to give me the lowdown on Danny Phantom. He is a high school kid whose parents are Ghostbusters. They uh, have some experiments that go wrong, because you can't have a cartoon show without an experiment that's going wrong, uh, and it turns him into a half-boy, half-ghost who must go to high school, be a normal boy, but also fight the powers of evil by being half-boy and half-ghost. So what's this summer's big special episode all about? This summer special reality trip uh, features Danny doing what apparently Danny does best, uh, struggle through high school to try to get, uh, get the girl and save the world at the same time. Uh, there's actually a bad guy in this one, uh, somebody who wreaks havoc, somebody who's dangerous, somebody that you try to stay away from, uh, a character named Freak Show, voiced by John Cryer. I'm sure you thought I was going Charlie Sheen, but, uh, but no, it's actually John Cryer who voices uh, the character of Freak Show. Well, that special airing of Danny Phantom plays out on Nickelodeon on June 9th. So right now, here's a three and a half minute preview. Catch the Danny Phantom reality trip special Friday, June 9th at 8 p.m. on Nickelodeon. And for the slightly older kids, the N, you know, that new nighttime network for teens, is rolling out a new series about four female surfers. That's called Beyond the Break. And Craig, some people are saying this is like uh, Baywatch Junior. Is that a good thing? But I will say that actually uh, the comparison holds because David Chokichi, late of Baywatch, uh, plays uh, the, the guy who kind of watches over these four young girls in the show. So there's, we're bridging that Baywatch gap a little I bit. See. I loved him in his old sitcom, uh, Joni Loves Chokichi. Um, my question is, who is the target audience for this show? Uh, you know, in, in theory, the show is, is for teenagers. It's kind of hard to find a teenager who doesn't want to go live in Hawaii and surf on the beach and really not have a real job, as most of these kids don't. Uh, it's kind of a little wish fulfillment for, uh, you know, any teenager who wants to just sort of lay in the sun for a while. So, Craig, who are the characters in this show and what exactly do they do? Uh, well, it's four girls who have come to Hawaii from very different backgrounds. You've got, uh, uh, you've got the, the local girl. You've got uh, the girl with the troubled past that we're not going to quite know about. We've got uh, the girl who dropped out of college to go uh, to try to learn how to surf. And uh, best of all, a Paris Hilton-like, uh, kind of a Hawaii Hilton girl here who's the party girl uh, who you know stays up till four and then goes surfing. So you, you don't get more drama than that. 
Right on, Craig. Well, kids, nighttime viewing is about to change with Beyond the Break. Here's a sample of what you can expect. Let me get this straight. You don't want me here anymore. Be careful what you wish for. Also on the end is Whistler. That's a show that centers on the famed Canadian Mountain Resort. The setting is winter, and it's all about the powder. We're talking a drama about skiing. So, Craig, my question for you is, the N is going for the C, and now they're going for the ski. What is Whistler about? Well, you know, you've heard of soap operas. We're going to go with this one as a slope opera, if you will. Um, it's, uh, it's actually kind of like Dynasty for teenagers in a way. There's a big mountain resort, famous mountain resort in Canada. Skiers go there all the time. But one day, a gold medalist snowboarder is found dead. The brother of the gold medalist snowboarder has to find out who killed him. Uh, and the suspects are immediately either the really rich family in town, then there's the poor family in town, there's the people who own the tavern in town. Lots of class warfare, lots of uh, soapy intrigue. That sounds fun, and I forgive you for the slope opera comment. Uh, now, is there an advantage to airing a show that's set in snow during the summer months? Uh, you know what? You're, you're in the middle of a 90 degree heat wave. I, you know, it would be kind of fun to see somebody skiing and uh, kind of wish fulfillment. You want to be out there in the snow a little bit. Uh, after you've seen the surfers, then you want to go cool off, go to the snow. Well, this sounds actually like a really cool and smart, fun show. It may be summer, but get ready for a cool winter blast as we check out this scene from Whistler. Usually, a death is the end of a story. Mine's just the beginning. Whistler premieres on June 30th, and that just about wraps it up for this special TV Guide Summer Preview. I want to thank TV Guide Magazine's West Coast Bureau Chief, Craig Tomashoff. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. And for a complete list of all the new shows out this season, you know TV Guide Magazine is your one-stop guide for all things TV. I'm Jeff